<laughs> uh, there's this. Uh, I'm this married to 20 percent of the people. And that's what <laughs> Not Which anymore. sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, Thanks sounds for coming, funny. Ryan. Uh, I was going to say that um, I, I made a joke in this uh, article I just wrote on teaching with Twitter that um, uh, one thing that happens is that when we assign research papers, uh, it causes great harm to the health of the grandparents of our students. <laughs> and therefore, students have to miss a variety of deadlines. And, uh, and I made the joke that when I taught with Twitter, students were talking so much about the class that they felt internally, internally motivated, socially motivated, mm -hmm. to come to the class, and, and that therefore it had really a beneficial effect on the health of the relatives of all of my students. And therefore, if only for that reason, we should all be teaching on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so um, some of our, our colleagues are also uh, obviously behind uh, on their deadlines and are working on those now. But uh, one of our colleagues who's here and who I wanted to uh, start with is uh, Winder McConnell who is the director of the Teaching Resources Center here at UC Davis, who I've invited to offer a few comments. Winder? Thanks, and in, I know how valuable the time is also for Leslie, so I'm going to defy my Celtic roots, having been born in Ireland, and not start at, uh, shall we say, Genesis and end up with Thrill Life. <laughs> I would like to say a few things, though. First of all, some of you know that the Teaching Resources Center is going through quite a transitional period. Unfortunately, we're losing Leslie to Boise State, Idaho in uh, August, end of July. So, and Andy uh, will still be on the campus and still, I think, available for certain things here and there, but we'll be going over full-time to the Writing Center. Leslie's position will be replaced. Um, I'd like to be the eternal optimistic Irishman and assume that at some point down the road, uh, Andy's four sevenths of a position we might be able to, to get back. Um, I would like to uh, also mention that, of course, this is going to require some change, some modification to programs. We have basically four categories. Those programs that will be continued, those which will have to be modified, those which will be suspended, and those which may have to be eliminated. Um, and we are working on that now. Um, the Summer Institute on Teaching Technology, for example, will be reduced to a two-day session this June, which Andy and um, Leslie will be uh, sponsoring. The current program, faculty mentoring faculty, will not be abandoned, and I will see what I can do but on a more limited basis during the fall, winter, and spring quarters. Um, I won't go to, through the litany of all of the other programs that would take much time, but these are ones I think that you're particularly uh, interested in. And without taking too much more time, I would just like to extend my thanks to Andy for the remarkable years of dedication, uh, innovation, uh, and uh, tirelessness putting together this program so that it could meet just about every week of the academic uh, year. Uh, to Leslie for everything that she has been doing here also as an assistant to the director over the, over the years. Uh, these are very, very difficult, um, in fact almost impossible acts to follow. And so uh, I wish you, Leslie, Godspeed, all the very best in your you. new position. Um, I'm still willing to sell you at Winchester. Uh, she's going to Idaho. Uh, and he actually offered to sell me a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. Uh, <laughs> and Andy, I, I hope and uh, I'm sure we will see your face on many an occasion here. Uh, it, well, maybe on fewer occasions, because there will be fewer of them, but on those occasions when we do have something here. Uh, uh, as part of our, our group. Thank you all very, very much. I know you, some of you here belong to the um, regular attendees, and uh, needless to say, this, in absentee of to those who otherwise would fill these seats, is uh, meant for everybody's consumption. So thank you again for coming. Andy, Leslie, once again, my thanks. thanks. Thank you, Winder. Uh, to add to what Winder has already said, um, 
think none of us were surprised that uh, once Leslie got into the interview portion of this job search, that soon <coughs> she was offered a job. Well, we took five years. Right. <laughs> it only took her five years to get that far. But once she was there, she was a lock. <laughs> and, and I think that's partly uh, true, at least from my perspective. I've been on, I've hired Leslie twice now yeah. uh, for two different positions. She interviews very well, and she does that because uh, it's clear to anyone in a room with her that she's a great colleague, that she's very insightful, that she knows uh, from our perspective at the TRC a great deal about teaching uh, and also different ways of connecting with uh, students that is uh, really refreshing for uh, people interviewing her and talking to her about uh, teaching issues. Uh, she also knows a, a great deal about uh, public history and really a great number of other topics, and that in part is the topic of her presentation. We've been very grateful to have her as part of the Teaching Resources Center for years now, and we wish her good luck in her new position and I'm very pleased that uh, she agreed, after some arm twisting, to, uh, to present this talk today as uh, one of the ways that she could uh, reflect on her work here as a uh, faculty member and as a, a member of the staff at the Teaching Resources Center with her presentation called The Undisciplined Instructor. Ladies and gentlemen, Leslie Madsen Brooks. Thank you so much for coming today. I know, yes, applause is necessary. So, uh, thank you so much for coming today. I'm not going to talk for very long. Mostly, um, I'd rather have a discussion because I know there's some really bright minds in here and we can all learn from each other. But um, I just wanted to talk a little bit today about um, what I've learned from a good deal of um, discipline switching and um, contingency uh, sort of jobs I've taken. Um, and I know many of us are in a similar position in terms of like if you're in say uh, the history department and someone says you need to teach Chinese history, uh, you may need to step up and you've never taught that before. So um, some tactics I've developed too when one is in one of those situations. So here is the sort of expected path that you're supposed to take through the humanities. So you get your BA, your master's, your PhD, and then you either go directly to the tenure track assistant professor or you kind of um, take a, a slight detour through postdoc adjunct or visiting assistant professor. And this was my path. <laughs> so the green things are things I did sequentially. The purple arrows are ones um, that were I held concurrently or did concurrently. Um, and so um, I, I've been through a number of disciplines and um, a number of different positions. And as a result, I've picked up a lot of sort of emergency teaching um, practices. Just there's me huffing and puffing um, just as I went through um, all of these different fields. And one of the things that I came to realize is that um, you know we're truly really trained to be disciplinary and that there are rules of our disciplines and there's certain content that we're supposed to know, that we're expected to know as experts, and that uh, our students, are, we're supposed to somehow convey to our students. But then I realized that, and, and often I felt a little bit like I'm in the wrong discipline um, because uh, I have so many disciplines um, that I'm drawing from. Um, but I realized then that undergraduates are almost always in the wrong discipline. Like they take so many general education courses. So um, that's helped me put myself even more in their shoes as an instructor who wants to practice student-centered learning. Um, so one of the things that I, um, that this forced me to do because I'd often find myself in front of a classroom either as a TA, um, for example, I TA'd in, um, I TA'd classes on religion, um, biotechnology, technocultural studies. I didn't know anything about any of these things. Um, and so uh, instead of uh, locking myself up in a room with a mile high stack of books and causing myself a good deal of anxiety, I just decided that I would learn alongside the students and literally just be one step ahead of them. Um, and to put more emphasis on these learning objectives that you hear us talk so much about. Now, um, not here necessarily, um, but elsewhere, like uh, I read a lot of academic blogs, and there's a lot of disdain for uh, centers for teaching excellence out there, teaching resource centers. Um, the idea that there's this professional class of people who don't actually, who aren't actually in the classroom, who come in and dispense advice um, gleaned from research or you know the best advice on pedagogy or whatever. And and one of the um, things that often comes in for for criticism are the idea of student learning outcomes or student learning objectives. But um, I really do kind of get behind these. Um, and uh, as, a, as a faculty 
member as well as, you know, as someone whose job it is to teach people how to teach. Um, and these are, this is from the UC Davis um, undergraduate, uh, Vice Provost of Undergraduate Studies website. So um, the list of communication skills, or sorry, the list of um, sort of objectives that the university has for its undergraduates. Um, and um, by virtues, this is an odd one, cultivate the virtues. It sounds so ancient Greece, but it's, um, uh, they mean like uh, ethics, honor, that sort of thing, the academic virtues. Um, and uh, I would say that in any one of my classes, I try to do maybe four or five of these. I have to admit that I don't always cultivate the virtues or develop a global perspective in my students. Um, so, uh, so, that, so the objectives tend to be a framing device for my courses, but one of the other um, pieces that has really fallen into place for me, especially as regards lifelong learning, is how can what I'm teaching um, impact students and get them to sort of change the world or their world or their community. Um, and this quote I pull from um, George Henderson, so in case you can't read it, it says, uh, what are the forms of resistance and agency that really count as we contemplate a plausible socially just society? Which forms are to be supported and nurtured? Which forms have yet to be initiated? In what ways, if at all, can, and he says, landscape study and the conception of landscape help with answers to these questions? But you could insert any discipline name in there and ask yourself, you know, well, if this were K through 12, right, we would have uh, standards that we had to teach to, right? And I think I feel very lucky that I don't have these standards and these kind of high stakes tests. And so uh, we can ask ourselves these questions instead, these sort of bigger questions, so that we're not um, falling prey to, and, and again, I use this, this term and I wish I had coined it, but I didn't, the tyranny of content, right? Where we're so overwhelmed by content that we're not necessarily thinking about like, well, this is the students one, history class or one essay writing class that they're gonna get as a general education requirement. And for the students, they're just checking a box, but how can we um, take this opportunity to really make an impact um, on their lives? So there are a few different ways that um, I found to um, start off with a course, start off a course when I don't know anything about what I'm, I'm teaching, right? So, um, so for the fall, and I hope my colleagues from Boise State don't discover this video, um, I, I'm teaching the American History Survey from, you know, when time began through 1877, the end of Reconstruction. And um, the last time I took a course like that, I was 15 years old. So um, I really don't know what I'm talking about for vast swath of that time. You know, I know the outline. There are certain decades I know a lot about, um, but I don't. Like if you, you know, ask me about the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist, I don't know what that's about. So one of the ways that I um, start off slowly for myself and with students is to take um, an, an object that they can relate to. And um, it's not necessarily getting away for them to identify with people living in another time, for example, because they don't necessarily need that personal identification, but it's a way of getting them to think, um, starting with something that's very familiar to them. So for example, in a course about um, American culture more broadly, um, or in a course about the 1950s, I've taught a course on the 1950s, um, I might bring in a Tupperware bowl. And I might bring in one from the 1950s and the 1970s and today. And we might look at those and go through, um, Jules Prown is an art historian, and he has um, this sort of method that he takes students through where they uh, describe an object. So they say, it's made of plastic, it's yellow, it's six inches in diameter. It has a top that when you pull it off, makes a little burping sound, you know. Um, and then they deduce what it was used for. Well, it's airtight. It might have been used to store, I don't know, uh, something that was stinky or maybe food, you know. Uh, and then he has them do what he calls interpretation or he also refers to it as cultural daydreams. So what can we learn about this culture that made this thing and that used this thing? And then from there, he asked them to do um, research on this object and then to um, make an argument about the object. Um, and Tupperware is like a really great object to start off a course on, on the 50s for a number of reasons. I mean, you have, um, so you have to choose your objects carefully, you know, but you've got um, the rise of plastics, you have women's entrepreneurship and the rise of sort of multi-level marketing. Um, you have, there were refrigerators around, right? You have people storing food. You have people who were um, 
children in the Depression or whose parents came through the Depression, and so they have this urge to save food, to keep extra food. So there's a lot of um, different things you can do with objects. And then I could even bring it up to the current day to say, well, we still use Tupperware. Tupperware has petroleum in it. What's happening in the Gulf of Mexico right now? And drawing you know, all of these connections in American culture. So I don't necessarily need to know anything about the 1950s because I have a piece of Tupperware. Um, and it's a good place to start. And then I can build out a um, little bit by bit from there rather than being like, oh my god, what was going on with um, you know, all of the, with the Soviet Union and who was whose ally during World War II or whatever. I just start very basic. So um, objects has been a great way for me to um, get with the students. And it not only helps me, but the students are like, oh yeah, I've eaten out of Tupperware. I know what Tupperware is. I have old Tupperware from my grandmother. It looks different from today's Tupperware. Why is that? Um, another thing that I um, do is um, take students um, places. And I know Ryan is a huge fan of this and has used this to, to great effect. Um, in my, um, I teach museum studies at John F. Kennedy University and I teach sort of a history and theory class. And one of the things that always comes up is um, you know, museums' responsibilities for objects and what kind of care should museum objects receive. And students have this idea that every museum object in America is kept in a climate-controlled, humidity-controlled room under armed guard. You know? um, and and uh, I, didn't, I didn't take a picture of the place we went. This is a picture of the basement of the Powerhouse Museum in Australia, which is actually a really nice um, collections facility. But I took them into the Phoebe Hearst Museum in Berkeley, which has the um, largest collection besides the Smithsonian. Um, and there's literally stuff piled on top of stuff and Grecian urns sitting out in earthquake country with no protection just sitting on a shelf or a mummy in a plastic bag with a post-it note that says mummy number three on it. So students can go um, you know, see what this crisis looks like and if they're going to go work in museums what they might be up against and see the insects and see the old, um, what is it, halon? Uh, fire suppression systems that takes all the oxygen out of the air. Um, you know, and knowing that like if those go off you've got a minute to get out before you die. You know, and, um, and it, really, it really helps them and opens up their eyes and, and many times just taking them on those field trips leads them to, for example, s switch from education to collections or vice versa, looking at collections saying, I don't want to have to deal with this. I'm going over to education or to management or to fundraising. I'm sure Ryan has um, more to say about that. Another um, way that I really get students engaged often is just to go out in public and have them observe people um, or um, sort of do a close reading of a space. So I might have them go off and look at different spaces around UC Davis um, and have them try to determine sort of what cultural messages um, those spaces are sending or how people use those spaces in ways that they're not supposed to be used or um, what cultural work those spaces are performing. And the students um, really enjoy that. I had the students a few years ago do a survey of Covell Boulevard. I broke them into groups and each group had a series of blocks of Covell Boulevard that they photographed and then mapped on a, there's a place that pulls from Google Maps. It's called communitywalk.com. And the students then um, wrote a little analysis of each, for example, shopping center or major feature all the way along Covell Boulevard through all of Davis. So sort of did this, this transect through town and they really um, enjoyed it. Um, another skill um, that I think, so I think that students should be able to um, extrapolate from objects. I think they should be able to read public space. I think that they should have this experience of being out in the world. And another um, thing that I think they should be able to do is to um, read a, an object that is relevant to, um, or read a, an image that's relevant to class. How do I turn off the lights in here? Anyone know? Okay, okay. Um, so um, I just want to do a quick little exercise with you here. So um, in, in a class, you know, after we've I've talked to students about public spaces and about um, material culture, so the clothes people wear, and a little bit about history, I might say, um, I might show them this picture and say, well, what's going on here? How close can you get to guessing where this is, who the people are, and th that's good, thanks. Yeah, and, and who the people are in the picture, what's going on, and, and everything, and, and teaching them how to read this image so that they have this kind of visual literacy. So uh, what are you guys seeing in this image? I mean, if you were to use Prown steps and to describe what's in the image, what do we see? Possibly stuff, so it looks like those people are Chinese, maybe, and they're unloading some kind of truck. Or, uh, hay bale. It, looks like it looks like a hay bale, or it could be a bunch of rags almost looks like it's okay. well, the basic thing is you can tell plus the way the, the calligraph holes that it's dated it's 
probably 1940s, 50s, thereabouts, maybe earlier. The clothing also. The clothing as well. Yes, yeah, so before 1940. In the Ameri American. You think it's American? It, well, yeah. looking at that thing up at the top, my, is that patio? Uh, yeah, it was written. Yeah. Right up at the top. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to tell what that is. But you've got a little bit of influence, maybe a, a little bit of um, possibly Asian architecture, Victorian architecture. It's hard to see in this photo. Uh -huh. It looks urban. It's urban. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of brick. Sidewalk, yeah, brick. So, um, and if I told you this... It's a fortress of a building, so it's a very strong brick building. Yeah, and so if I told you that this is, um, and it's probably not a leap, if I told you that this is uh, between the Chinese and the buildings, if I told you this was San Francisco, and you saw brick buildings, you might be able to extrapolate and say, well, 1906, all of those brick buildings fell down. So this mm -hmm. is before 1906. Interesting. Okay. Right, so I try to walk the students through this. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's a rope here. Mm -hmm. And there's this guy who seems mm -hmm. to be passing stuff under the robe. And these two guys, who we're saying are Chinese, and they do have these long Q braids, mm -hmm. and they're walking down the street. So what's up with that? What are some like deductions you might make, or guesses, or cultural daydreams, to borrow Jules Prown's phrase? Is there segregation going on? In there's some kind of segregation going on, yeah. Oh, and that's passing so this on. Is oh, Chinatown, that, the edge of China, this is the edge of Chinatown in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, good. See, look how far we've come. So well, that's rope as that's a rope barrier. That's rope across as a barrier. Okay. But did they have that, really? Well, in... It's just it, to cordon it off so nobody stumbled over whatever this For a thing. short time, they did. Not for a long time. So this is 1900. Meaning the Chinese couldn't leave or nobody else could go in? Or well, so that's a good question. Like, is this, is this is this segregation or is it quarantine? Mm. Right? Right. So these are the kinds of questions that I try to leave my students down. And again, hey Paul, I don't need to know a lot about, necessarily, about the Chinese in San Francisco, or, and, and neither do my students. They can learn to read these cues and, and gain curiosity. I mean, you're probably all curious now, like, what the mm -hmm. heck is going on in this picture? Right. Well, this is San Francisco, 1900. There was the plague mm. in the Barbary. Uh, the Barbary oh. plague, they called it, it hit Chinatown. Chinatown had dirt basements, and the rats were able to tunnel through in other areas of the city that had cement basements. And so um, Chinatown was quarantined. It was partly a racist move. I mean, there was plague that popped up in other parts of the city as well. It was particularly fierce in Chinatown. And people still needed to bring their laundry down to Chinatown to uh -huh. get it, it cleaned. Um, so you see a bundle of rags there, right? Um, or clothing, possibly. Um, could be clothing in the, in, the, um, in the trunk or food. Um, and people weren't allowed to go in or out of Chinatown at that time. There's a great book about it called The Barbary Plague. Um, flared up again in 1906 when the rats came out after the earthquake. So uh, anyway, my point being that walking the students through this kind of exercise, it opens up things in a way of they're just saying, like, this is a picture uh, of Chinatown uh, at the turn of the century. Do we know what they're carrying? I don't know exactly what they're carrying. Um, it wasn't labeled in the. Is the bundle in action? Like, is it going to fall over? Is it it like kind of looks like it's falling over. It almost looks like he's been throwing it. But yeah. I don't. But it doesn't. I don't know. It seems like it would be blurry. I don't know enough about. Although it is outside, I don't know enough about shutter speed at the time. I know that Jacob mm -hmm. Reese, you know, 30, 20, 30 years before, had to like set himself on fire a couple times. You know, trying to set a flash in a pan so he could take pictures in the tenements, or he used um, flare guns. You know, but so outside, I don't know about shutter speed. Yeah. Um. So. Going, um, so those are the sort of the, the, the themes that I always return to, right? Taking students outside of the classroom, taking them into public space. Um, and again, this is maybe more of a humanities social science thing, but it also could be, you know, you take your students down to the local watershed um, if you're doing science or, you know, whatever. Um, you take them to a local sewage processing plant. Um, I, so I've been thinking about uh, public space, um, taking students on field trips, to look at things that are relevant to the class or to their future, um, teaching with objects like the Tupperware, and, and teaching with images, and that those things really engage students and also keep me from having to give a long lecture, prepare for hours to give a lecture that one, no one's going to remember 15 minutes after it's done, um, two, isn't very interesting, and three, becomes kind of a waste of my time. Um, but going forward, there are a few things that I've been thinking about, um, directions I need to move. And one of them is as I become um, someone who teaches history, and this will be my first time, though I've taught American studies, this will be my first time teaching history, um, and particularly large survey courses in history. Um, I've been thinking a lot more about narrative 
and what kinds of stories do we tell about history, um, which is really big right now, you know, with the Texas textbook thing and the Arizona ethnic studies thing and the, the stories the Tea Partiers tell about Jefferson or whatever. Um, so, so the ways that Americans tell stories. But then I've also been thinking about like course design as um, a narrative and how can I set up my courses so that there's not that much exposition, right? Because exposition is boring. I'm not just dumping content on students. And then, you know, how do I like complicate things? What riddles or puzzles can I throw at students? And then what looks like the climax for the course? And what's sort of the following action or the resolution to the issues that we've raised? And then, of course, I'm in grading jail. That's not the end of the stories. But that's sort of <laughs> extrapolating out from there. Um, so thinking of the, the shape of the course um, is uh, becoming increasingly important to me as I begin to talk about stories that people tell. Um, I'd also like to become more of an edgy punk. <laughs> this is my friend uh, Jim Groom at the University of Mary Washington. He coined the term edgy punk. He's an educational technologist um, there. Um, and edgy punk uh, sort of critiques um, education as, as uh, usual, critiques this idea that we all have to use the same course management system, uh, that at most campuses it needs to be blackboard, that, they, that um, things need to be driven by the bottom line. Um, and really encourages faculty to and students to sort of roll their own systems for learning, particularly around technology, um, and to really empower students using technology to take um, control of and um, sort of take agency for their own their own knowledge. So three things that I'm going to be um, that I've been playing around with. Um, I know Andy did this shtick earlier. <laughs> Um, 11, was it 11 things you're going to be doing? Just 10. Just 10, okay, 10 things. Um, God, the color in this is really bad. This is actually bright red. Um, three things. Um, one is there is a um, platform called Omeka, developed by the awesome folks at the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. And it's a um, simple collections management software. Um, and a collection can be anything. It can be images, it can be um, objects, it can be um, audio, video, whatever um, that you can, that's digitally available. Um, and you upload this into the collection and from there students can make exhibits um, or can combine things that can combine objects into their own collections depending on what taxonomies they want to create. Um, and it's, uh, the omeka.org is where all of the documentation is but they recently started up omeka.net which is a, a hosted version that you pay for so you don't have to install it on your server. And I've just barely begun working with Omeka so I don't have a prototype to show you. But if you go to their site they do have links to a lot of um, different sites that are using this um, in disciplines outside history as well. So it's a, it's a nice place to um, have students build things. Um, the other thing that I've been using more and more is um, WordPress which is a um, has traditionally been known as a blogging platform but also is a content management system really. Um, at wordpress.org, you can download a version of WordPress that then you um, upload to a server that you've um, purchased space on. Um, and that gives you some more flexibility. Or there's a free hosted version at wordpress.com. And I've been using wordpress.com in my classes. I know Andy's been using um, some WordPress in his courses as well. It's a really great open source platform. It's electronically accessible. So um, for students with disabilities who have run into some difficulties with SmartSite, um, WordPress can take care of some of the stuff that SmartSite does. It doesn't have a grade book or anything. But it's a, a really um, terrific platform. And then finally, I don't know if you guys um, have noticed, but um, recently um, Prof Hacker, which is a blog that was started by um, some folks I know um, around the country, um, faculty, uh, is a blog that talks about all the different ways that you can sort of to use a popular term, sort of hack your life. So how do you hack your syllabus? Like how can you make um, your syllabus more meaningful um, and you know, more efficient? How can you get more writing time in the day? Um, how can you pack a healthy lunch in the morning? I mean, it's, it's got everything. Um, and, but really what Prof Hacker's biggest strength is is in um, talking about new technologies and talking about them in a way that makes sense to those of us who don't, aren't highly technical. Um, and it's really inspiring some of the things that people have managed to get um, done with, with their students. So, um, so moving forward, I want to experiment with more platforms. I want even more student interactivity, more hands-on technology, because in the field that I'm going to be in, public history, students need to be um, really aware of the different digital tools that are available. And that's 
my talk. So in a little capsule. I wanted to leave time for um, Q&A and discussion. But we never get enough of that. You and I have talked a little bit about this, but uh, what sort of approach to um, content management and course management uh, is being implemented at Boise? And to what extent do you feel that you've got, um, that, that that will work for you? Will you be working against the grain that they have there? What do you anticipate? Yeah, um, unfortunately they have Blackboard. So, um, people who don't know, say a little bit more about so Blackboard is basically, it's very much like SmartSite, only it's not open source, it's commercial. Right. So I'm, I'm not a huge fan of learning management systems in general. You know, they're a good place to get your roster and a good place to submit grades, but other than that, you know, mm -hmm. they don't do that much for me because they don't necessarily build community among students where students are talking to each other in comments and sharing links with each other and uploading video or whatever. So, yeah. So, um, there, very interestingly, their teaching center um, oversees their technology people. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if the, um, if the dynamic is a bit different there, whereas here we're a little bit more bifurcated. We're under separate vice provosts. Right. Yeah. Wendell? Well, one of the things, um, Leslie, that I, I get concerned about has to do with content. And Probably from a very different perspective than the way you, from the way you're looking at it. Um, once you get to, I think, to a certain age, you hear more and more people say, "Well, students sure don't know as much now as they did in well, I came here in '78, so say 32 years ago." And these are generalities; they're not based on any statistics. It's usually an observation that's come out based on experience, based on on years and years and so on of comparing students and I'm, I'm always wary of that uh, because you wonder is it just a phenomenon that is connected with getting older uh, and that you, you tend to uh, say well if my well, I was a kid that type of thing right but I I also wonder about the veracity of it whether in fact there isn't some of that that is true um, and since History, I think, is a marvelous example uh, to, to take. Uh, it has been my experience that the, the amount, and, and not just history, but geography, political science, that, that whole mm -hmm. maze of, of interactions and with all of the yapping about globalization and so on, I, I f do find that students, when it comes to content, basic content, about the way the world was, or it has been, the way it is, can't predict what it will be, they, they very often are very sophisticated with regard to equipment and how to find things, but not really to have digested what has either they, they've either seen or they didn't know where to look, uh, and to be able to express themselves about that, uh, to be able to give a cogent argument as to why that perhaps came about this way. The, the very basic facts themselves aren't there. And I don't think we can ignore that. Right, exactly. Um, and, there, and, and, and there are two parts to that, right? I mean, when we say students uh, don't know what we expect them to know, right? That's, in a way, you could be saying students learn different things growing up than I learned growing up, right? Um, and Part of that is the culture, what, right? What they value has shifted. So that may be part of it, as you say, getting older. But another huge, huge part of it, and I know this from many members of my family teach in the public schools, is uh, that No Child Left Behind, and even before No Child Left Behind came in, there was this high stakes testing, right? Um, where everything's about basic grammar and uh, math and basic reading comprehension. And you're not getting the sciences, you're not getting PE, you're not getting um, history, you're certainly not getting geography, right? The students um, aren't getting um, tested on these things. And the teachers, uh, you know, continued employment, the money that their schools get are tied to how well the students do on these tests. And um, some teachers have said to me, well, uh, now that the testing's over, I can finally teach. You know, and they teach that last month of the school year. So like they can actually get the students to do things. Or, you know, and it starts off really early, so a friend of mine, her daughter's in kindergarten, 
her daughter's not even in kindergarten. She's in a, a pre-kindergarten in the public schools uh, in Virginia. And uh, they just spent four days, two hours a day, doing these tests, these standardized tests. And her kindergartner came home and said, Mommy, I'm so tired of tests. I'm so glad I'm going to real school next year. You know, not realizing that she's going to have to take tests there as well. But I think that this, this, this testing gets the students to think in terms of multiple choice or short answer, things that can be graded by um, and scored by machines or by people who are paid, you know, three cents a, a response to, to score these tests. So it's a, um, you know, it's, what's interesting though is that um, I was just reading an editorial the other day and I can't remember where I saw it, where someone was saying, you know, college professors are always saying, stupid public schools, you're not preparing students the way they should be prepared for their freshman year. And this high school was a high school teacher and, and he was saying, well, how about you change your um, admission standards so that you're not caring as much about SAT scores or ACT scores or you're giving credit for the AP tests. You know, you're not giving this kind of credit for the AP tests. And that instead, you say, to get into college, you have to be able to write a thesis statement and support it with evidence. You know, how about you do these mm -hmm. kinds of things? Um, how about you already have taken two years of a foreign language so that you can communicate with people um, who, are, who are not like you and your family? You know, what if you change these requirements rather than... Um, you know, looking at these, these tests. It's a quick fix mentality in some respects, isn't it? And uh, I mean, I, forgive me, I, I, I know I use the word yapping about globalization. When I hear that word, it makes me sick, quite frankly, because uh, I understand it differently. Uh, I think that many of the people, including administrators at this university, um, but uh, for me personally, it would be predicated upon uh, your not only but your knowledge of another of other cultures, and very often based on your proficiency in the languages of those cu cultures too. Um, but we have very high level administrators who think that you can obtain your knowledge of a culture by taking one or two classes. And I got to where I am today as this administrator without ever having had a foreign language. And I think then don't talk about globalization, which incidentally outside this country usually is a euphemism for American imperialist policy and economics. Right. Right. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense, and, and you, you have a feeling, are people sleeping? Do they not realize this, that there's something beyond the borders? Antonella, you had your hand up. Um, oh, I, I, another question at the time, but I was now going uh -huh. back to what Wendy was saying. What I noticed is that I have um, stopped, uh, not complaining, but I mean, uh, now I take it for granted that uh, what I expect the students to know when they come in is not there. So my teaching now is different from before in the sense that now it's basically, I teach Italian language usually, in Italian, and Italian culture in English. But uh, when I'm in the Italian class now, is everything in Italian about culture, United States, Italy, you name it, history and geography. So um, I try to put it together. I mean, because I feel that otherwise I don't have much in common to talk about. And so I'm doing that plus talking about using a lot of images and what's going on and so on and so on and so on. And so on. Because otherwise, really, there isn't that much in common. So what, what Italian am I teaching to people who have no idea where Italy is? So we start by that. and. And so eventually, the two come together, the teaching of another language about what, though? About Italy and what's going on. But the, the first question that I had was um, looking at your course design as narrative and so on. Eventually, though, most universities will want, uh, students will want grades. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know there, is, there was that, that uh, grade prison or something, but how do you test, or how do you think you're going to test uh, both the content right, right. and how the students have learned these different ways of communicating and uh, how, how are you going to do so that? So the way that I've usually done that is mm -hmm. um, through writing. Through you writing, know, okay. Right, I don't, I don't, okay. I don't give, I've never given a multiple choice test. Mm -hmm. um, there may be some short answer, um, but uh, it's not necessarily, um, you know, straight essay prompts. So mm -hmm. it, it, it may be essay prompts. Um, I may give a midterm, a blue book midterm, where the students, I, I, I tend to give the, the students every chance to succeed. So I give them yeah, 
Um, like I may give them three essay prompts and say, okay, two of these are gonna be on your midterm. Mm -hmm. Prepare to write to one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that they have to do that kind of preparation. Um, and, and part of it is, is really like hand-holding and practicing these kinds of things. So one of the things I do is um, I may take all of the images I have in a class and I may um, put them on a sheet of paper and say, okay, um, or I may like have a couple of rows of images and each row of images might have three or four images and then I might say pick a row and write an essay that makes an argument that draw, builds on what we learned in class and uses these images as support. Right? And if they haven't come to class, they're not going to know what the taxidermy deer means. Right? Um, so it's, it, you know, I give them these opportunities to think in different ways, but it's almost always through writing. Um, because I believe that writing is really how people, how students think things, learn to think things through. Um, and they also have to learn to, you know, just the basic mechanics. Right. They have to practice that. So you're putting the two and two mm -hmm. the form and the content. Right, right. So it's all about ideas, but of course they have to draw on content from the course that we read in the books, that was presented in class, that came up on the class blog, whatever that they're drawing. Right, it's about synthesizing, right? It's, uh, and students don't know how to synthesize. Um, I used to work, years ago I worked for an a educational publishing company um, that specialized in what's called SIDAI, um, or Specially Designed Academic Instruction in English. And it targets second language learners of English. And the idea being that you don't give them as much text in like a social studies textbook mm -hmm. as you would give um, a native English speaker. But you use the same level mm -hmm. of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You don't dumb down the vocabulary, but you use more pictures or more enrichment or more audio or whatever. At the time, it wasn't so much audio. But you know, so that, and, and sometimes I kind of feel like I have to take that approach to my students, even if they aren't. Um, second language learners, and many of them are, but just to give them that kind of almost remedial approach to history, right? Mm -hmm. So they're getting less content, but what they're getting is still very rich. Got it. Some of are, you're, you're in the sciences, some of you, and you have lot, much larger classes, um, much, much larger classes. Why don't you give us some of the students? We'd love it. But what do you do when it comes to the writing component, or, or do you not you really don't have the time to to deal with that. I mean, students don't write, do they, essays on, let's say, biological problems or chemical problems? Or... I, personally, I punt on that. I mean, I teach physics and astronomy, and I, yeah, my approach is I'm, I've got enough on my plate, mm -hmm. you know, getting them to understand what I want them to understand without teaching them to write. So, and in my really large class, I use certain half multiple choice questions, which I feel guilty about, but. You know, I, I do have some short answer questions, but I'm not grading them on how well they write. Uh -huh. I have some lab write-ups where it's writing up a lab report, so there is some supposed independent thinking that goes on in the conclusions and the discussion sections. Um, but again, I think our expectations is that the students should come to us in upper division classes that have a lab like this, knowing how to write a lab report ahead of time. And again, that's something we struggle with, is it doesn't always feel that way. Right. They've had yeah. experience in other classes yeah. um, having to do that. So right. that's what we struggle with. And then, uh, uh, again, I have teaching assistants and readers that help me with the grading. And, and my experience uh, was in, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be in a gifted program in high school where we had teachers who really pushed us. But we wrote 20, 30 page lab reports in high school. And I got to college, and I thought that automatically I'd have to write a lab report for every lab. Instead, we had to fill out a worksheet. You know, so uh, the expectations were lower than they were for the high school. And so some students are, you know, are really gifted students are experiencing that as well. I mean, it's not all of our students. Though the culture, how like culturally illiterate our students are. I, got, I had another example of that today. Um, I just finished up teaching a, a seminar on, um, with Kathy Kudlick from the History Department on disabilities and what it's like to be a student with disabilities. And um, we ex examined everything from disability humor to the technology that people with disabilities use to help mainstream themselves. We had guest speakers come in who are students who are blind or who have learning disabilities. And the students, um, there were clearly a few students who weren't quite getting it, but many of the students came along for the ride and were like, oh yeah, you know, I'm learning a lot. And they didn't know such basic things as like, people with disabilities don't need our pity. You know, I mean, these were like basic things that they didn't know, but our culture says, you know, it's supposed to pity people with disabilities or being disabled means you use a wheelchair or whatever. So today, um, 
some of my students gave a um, my students gave final presentations, and the first one was so horrible um, that I thought, oh god, this is terrible. And we had representatives of the Student Disability Center there, and I thought, oh, this is so embarrassing. Um, but what happened is someone said, well, the question was asked, well, if you're doing this kind of presentation, um, well, the presentations were to have them do a um, propose a student disability um, awareness week or disability pride week on campus. And there was one group that was talking about, well, we'd have these kinds of presentations. And they were asked this basic question, well, if a deaf person showed up, how would you make sure that they get the content that this person is saying? And they said, well, we'd give them um, Braille. You know, so, I mean, just like really basic kinds of understanding. You know, we hadn't spelled out for the students, like, blind people use Braille, deaf people use interpreters, because we assumed that oh, yeah. they would have seen this or know this, but they don't. So, you know, the, the cultural literacy of our students, is, it can be really high. So, to return to the point about writing, I, mm -hmm. I've recently realized that's one of the weaknesses of our system, is that if we... Um, I think we should emphasize good writing in all classes and, um, and for the students to get the point that it's really necessary. And if, and if we think that, oh, they're going to have this one or two classes where they're going to learn good writing and that's it, that's not enough. It has to be enforced across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I, I, Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And but we're, we're very parochialized in our, in our departments. Like I think, okay, I want them to learn physics. And I'm not thinking of the bigger view of, you know, what should they get out of the university as a whole. Right. So what might happen is that we might back into the same sort of situation that Leslie was describing with No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. With No Child Left Behind, that was the point. That was a, um, uh, a consequence that is entirely expected, and that is that um, certain things would not be emphasized, such as uh, history or physical education or whatever, and that the people who are creating the program would, would recognize that. But we're kind of uh, fractured in our approach, and so... Often at, at UC Davis, we might hope that students, for instance, are getting enough exposure to writing and also some of the other uh, objectives for undergraduates that Leslie had up on the slide. But it, it might not be so because in our parochial way, we say, well, you know, I've, I've got to teach these important parts of what's going on in my physics uh, curriculum. One thing we should remember is that we've got a new uh, tool that we can make students available or aware of, and that is the writing minor at UC Davis, and that is that students can elect to take a, a number of classes that have a writing emphasis, including uh, scientific writing, for instance, writing and science, and, uh, and thereby um, ensure that they will have those sort of skills once they leave. And some of our more ambitious students will seek out these opportunities, but it's also a relatively young program, so not all of them know about it yet. Our students do have more autonomy than um, high school students do, right? That if you're in a gate program, it will um, so happen that students will cover a lot of the concerns that we're hoping for. Or some parents take it upon themselves to fill in gaps. You know, when you're a parent and you have this frustration, when I was a kid, we knew this, you might just say, well, here, let me explain whatever this is. Let me explain it to you. And kids really benefit <coughs> from that. But, uh, but as college students, they need to um, uh, they should be motivated to recognize these gaps and try to fill them mm. themselves. I, uh, coming back to use the word parochial, and I'm thinking about this now in a, in a larger sense. I'll, I'll use actually more the term fixed in granite with regard to certain ways mm -hmm. of doing things. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I found in, uh, as a non-American, but having had education in Ireland and also in Canada, is that there, there is a tendency to say, well, this is the way we've done it, and that's the way we've always done it. And, in, and I'm not suggesting that we we'll go out and adopt the manners, the methodologies, and so on of, of other systems, but some of them do work, and maybe do work better than some of ours, uh, the ones that we, we've been, been uh, using now for decades. Uh, I'll take one example. It's not on the undergraduate though. Um, Take, for example, graduate study, with which I've been involved also for decades. And as a graduate advisor, as a chairman of the department with PhD students and so on. And we perennially have these bloody discussions about the, the, the list of books that have to be uh, read and, and 
uh, the qualifying examination and so on. And I kept thinking back to 20 years ago when I had a guest professorship at the University of Stirling in Scotland. And a young lady in there finished up her Bachelor of Arts degree, wanted to pursue a degree in medieval uh, German literature. And once you got your Bachelor of Arts degree, that was it vis-a-vis -vis courses. She then went to an individual, talked to that person, a colleague of mine, a very good friend, who was an expert in the field. He said, certainly, I'll take you on. And from that person, she got the prerequisites that she needed in the various areas, the dialects, Old High German, Gothic, Old English, and so on and so forth, and the methodology needed to be able to look at the manuscripts, and six or seven years later, about the same amount of time that you need here, that usually is a PhD amount of study, that person came out with the PhD. Mm -hmm. Now that's been happening for generations over there, and nobody in his right mind would suggest for a second that their chemists, their physicists, their humanists in language or history or any of the other subjects are any less qualified than ours. Um, there's a hell of a lot less stress needless to say, and they know just as much, because they picked it up, of course, in a very, very different way. It's, it's, you're given a lot more freedom than you have here. This is a very, very structured system from the undergraduate year, from what you were saying, Leslie, from kindergarten through the elementary, through high school, into the university, and then I think when you get into certain disciplines as well, are any engineers around? <laughs> Engineering, wow. I mean, I admire our people, but my goodness me, that is a structured program. Mm -hmm. Very, very structured. Mm -hmm. Is there no leeway for looking at maybe other other methods, other paradigms? Well, I mean, I'm wondering if there's a middle ground. <laughs> because I, I look at, as a graduate student, my, my friends in the English department were in history, and the giant list of books they had to read, or the giant list of periods that they had to know, or countries like, you're going to do Chinese and the 18th century. You know. <laughs> What does that mean, right? Well, I'm over in cultural studies, and they're like, write your own list. Make up your own PhD, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and that didn't work out that well for me. For some people, it works out really well. And I'm not criticizing the program here. I'm just saying the structure of that didn't work out for well for me on the job market because people didn't know what I knew, mm -hmm. right? So there has to be something beside, between free form, build your own, mm -hmm. which is a great learning experience, but it doesn't get you an academic job if that's what you want, yeah. right? And here's the structure. There's no room for experimentation or innovation mm -hmm. at all. I don't know. What do you guys think? Brian, did you have a thought? Well, I, I, I come from geography as a discipline, so we're probably the most undisciplined discipline in certain ways. Um, and, and, and in my own graduate program, we had four different tracks that graduate students would be on, either physical geography, human geography, people mm -hmm. environment geography, or cartography, GIS. And within each of those, the faculty decided on if there were going to be lists or non-lists, and so in the one I was in, there was not a list. Uh, so we got to create our own with our advisors at the time. But human geography had these perennial battles between the the more radical human geographers and less radicals as to what should be in the canon, what shouldn't be. So I was just very thankful that I wasn't in the canonized kind of section there. Um, but yeah, so in a way, it was kind of a middle ground within the discipline. You can kind of choose to be more unruly or less unruly, if you will, within those different. And then physical geography had their own, they, they had their canon as well. Uh, so I was in the most unruly portion, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, I guess, um, to use that language, I wonder, Leslie, if you're going to see yourself as one of the more unruly members of your new history department. And, uh, and if you think you're going to be facing resistance from your faculty, from your students, mm -hmm. we're going to say, this is not the way that I've learned thus far. Right, and I'm fortunate in that sense, one, to be entering a department that seems very sympathetic to mm -hmm. what I'm doing. That's great. And two, to have been hired as a public history professor, mm -hmm. so that um, the rules are a little bit different, in that what I produce is supposed to be of by and for the people, <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Um, and, and it is a little bit more radical. And the, the National Council of Public Historians, I went to their conference for the first time, and those people really are like, we need clear um, guidance on, you know, what constitutes tenure. So that if someone spends, you know, uh, I was just reading on Twitter yesterday, you know, someone who spent, you know, had a hundred collaborators and worked together to put together this digital library on Tibet and Nepal, um, and doesn't get tenure, you know, but has created this fabulous resource, mm -hmm. and then, you know. So like, what are the, 
the rules there. But I, I'm fortunate in going in that they've said, you know, we're going to be very clear to you what you need to do to get tenure as a public historian versus as a more traditional historian. And that you don't have to be all things to all people. So I'm right. lucky in this context. But if I were elsewhere, I probably wouldn't be as, as lucky. So it's almost like you're being hired as a radical. And that some of the strategies that you shared with us, um, they're looking forward to you uh, sharing those widely with right. the Right. I mean, I mean and, and those of you who have grad students, um, what really got me in this job, I think, what made me stand out from other candidates is that I had experience overseeing master's theses and, and mm -hmm. advising graduate students, and I know how to use technology in ways for, for teaching and for research. And so, I mean, if you're, you're graduate students, it's hard for them to get experience mentoring other grad students, but um, the technology part is huge, huge. You know, when the, one of the other faculty asked me, well, who are your people? Are you more of an American Historical Society Association person? Are you an organization of American historians person? Are you an environmental historian? Are you a public historian? You know, where are your people? And I said, my people are on Twitter. You know, and I thought, oh, I just lost that job. <laughs> but I think that may have helped, you know? So. Um, first of all, I want to thank you one more time for giving me so many good ideas. But one thing I'd like to point out is this, that people who come to this kind of meetings and have been doing this for years, I don't know if it is just me, but what happens is that you get all these ideas and you want, and then you find, boom, the wall of your colleagues, your department or something else. Mm -hmm which is a very hard wall. Not just the pyramidal society um, medieval structure of the <laughs> university, which is already what it is, right? You know, the servants, the serfs, and then we get to the emperor. But within the structures. So what I found out is the more I come to these places, the more frustrated I get. Uh -huh. But it resolves itself when I realize that my interlocutors are actually my students. Mm -hmm. So this is how I have figured it out now, is that I work with the students and we work together. Mm -hmm. And that's work. And I ask them what's working for them. And I don't, don't tell them, you know, I'm going to, we're working together. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, when you try to, you know, say, hey, uh, can we talk about this? There are these new things coming up. Maybe we don't need to use it. On a continual basis, content, form, should we change the major, the major, should, that's when you find. Right. Antonella, in, in defense of this university system, <laughs> and in contrast to the medieval universities, for which I have a lot of respect, I a huge difference is you and you are here. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, I know. The medieval university. Right, I know, no, I understand. Ah, 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 ah. But I mean, this ability to change and, and welcome yeah. change and, you know, see what works and what doesn't. I mean, you have to discuss, you have to try it out, you right. can't. And a lot of, t maybe in the sciences is different because experimenting is, I would imagine, part of the deal. Then experiment, and it doesn't work, we'll do something else. It's you'd, welcome, be amazed. I'll think. you'd be amazed. Science faculty don't apply that philosophy. But well, then I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> I, I, I thought that that was you know. Yeah. I thought that that happens in the lab. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Although, although the, I will say that the physics department here, there are some people working in it who have been experimenting and innovating Clippers. and applying those like stringent research protocols. You know, I mean, when you videotape all of your TAs yeah. and then code each video for what the TAs are doing at any given moment, and you know, right. but it's the exception rather than the yeah. wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I mean, the, to me, this has been a source of, I mean, thinking, thinking, thinking all the time. I'm so happy when. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I may want to draw on some of you who are here today, actually, in the coming year, at some point, so you uh, uh, keep in touch. Well, I would, uh, right after inviting all of you to come back next week for the final presentation of the faculty mentoring faculty program in its current iteration, that'll be by Naomi Janowitz of Religious Studies. And she'll be bringing some of her graduate students to offer their perspectives. So uh, another welcome rule breaker here at FMFP. Uh, but um, after mentioning that, I would like to uh, thank Leslie not only for her presentation, but for her years of service on behalf of excellent teaching here at UC Davis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for such a great discussion, too. I really like that.